Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shahab Karni. From the studios of TVI 95, I'm here with you today with a new story and with a very amazing guest. I'm going to shortly introduce my guest to you. I'm sure you guys can see his picture and the name and the title. But the discussion or the conversation we are going to have with our guest today is whatever American society, especially in public arena, are going through, I call it polarization, a lot of mistrust between people of color, different colors, with respect to police reform, justice nationwide. Why I picked my guest today, there is a reason for it. Because the gentleman that you can see, and I'm going to introduce briefly uh, to you about his profile, that he's one of the very few that I've seen, especially across the aisle within the Republican Party and within the Democratic Party, who are willing to work across the aisle, you know, within the different parties. So the gentleman that I have with is State Delegate Rick Metzger from State of Maryland. Good afternoon. Welcome, Mr. Metzger. How are you today? Good afternoon, my friend. Good to be here. All right. So whatever in my intro I mentioned, do you agree with that one? But before we go to that length, please introduce to our viewers a little bit of your background, how you came up to this, how you became the delegate, and how long you've been in the public policy arena. Absolutely. My pleasure. Uh, I'm they have to be honest with you. I've, I've told people for many years that I came out of my mother's womb uh, being involved in, in politics. My, my background is that I'm a Republican, but I was raised in a house that had a, a Democrat father and a Republican mother. And uh, the biggest argument that I've ever seen in my family was that my mother voted for President Nixon and my father had voted for John F. Kennedy. And she got so mad at him that she threw a cup of coffee at him. But I have to tell you, Mr. Carney, that when my mother back in the 60s in Baltimore County was able to get uh, Sparrow T. Agnew elected as county executive as a Republican back in the 60s. And you got to remember when, when that happened, there was 10, 12 Democrats to every Republican. So then my mother was able to uh, convince him to run for governor and, and in Baltimore County, and he won a landslide in uh, 1967 or 68. I can't remember that far back, but I remember him becoming governor. And then uh, I've, they were coming to my house as a young person. Back then it was called Think Tanks, and that was Saturdays, and I involved myself they had donuts and coffee. Well, I was more interested in the, in the donuts. You can tell by my cavity. I was more interested in the donuts and the, the fellowship. But in the spirit of that, that politics got in my, my body. And then the, the idea of helping people got involved in myself and, and began to realize that I had a love for people. And when you stir that gift of love for people, there's a gift that also comes with that. And that's called compassion. And when you look at people's lives and you realize where they might have come from, see, people don't know the stories that where people come from, so they don't know where that they people can go to. And uh, I've always said I've been down here and up here, but I can relate to everybody on the on the level. With that said, when I began to see that things weren't exactly going right, I said to my wife one time. You know, if I was in Annapolis, they would hear my voice. So my wife said to me, what are you going to do? And I said, well, tomorrow I'm going to Annapolis and I'm going to run for office and sign up. And I, I started to, to campaign immediately. And I will tell you uh, that when I, after the first week of knocking on doors in our district, again, was five, seven Democrats to every Republican. I told my wife, I'm in this for the long haul. And she said, well, November's a long time away. I said, no, no, it's going to take three times for me to win. And and, it, and when I lost the first time, people that ran, they got discouraged and jumped out. I kept going and kept uh, doing my message, uh, leadership, integrity, 
and using those kind of things and crossing the aisle and vision. You have to give people a vision. You have to give people the, the, the what you want to get accomplished. You've got to share that. But you also at the same time say, we can't do this alone. We need to work together to get things accomplished. You can get more done by working together than you can apart. So I immediately began to, to work in across the aisle to get the people to realize what was taking place. I have to tell you, Sharab, that back then, when when I began to ran, Bethlehem Steel was still here, and they were firing people, laying people off. Uh, Chevrolet was still here. Lever Brothers, a lot of the factories were still here. And the people, the union was such a stronghold on people that they could not trust the Republican. They thought all Republicans were against the union. Well, I was raised in a, a home that had union base, so I understand how they operate and work. But the process was that you work together. I had mentors in my life, such as Helen Bentley. You know, Helen Bentley was the one who really, back in 1963, stopped a huge strike at the Glen L. Martin Company as a TV reporter. People don't realize that she was a reporter and she was the one who really negotiated the contract dispute between the United, back then it was under the United Auto Workers and the aerospace. So that was a huge thing. So I saw how you work together, even as a child. So, <clears throat> so with that said, my, my desire of getting into the, the political realm was to be able to help people. Now, my background as well as as a minister, so you have a gift. And, and I had to stir that gift up, <coughs> excuse me, the gift of compassion. And that gift of compassion, my friend, is something that I cherish as an individual to care for people, not just the ones in your little circle. Excellent. So, Excellent, Delegate Mesger. Before we go to the topic uh, this afternoon that I just mentioned in my intro, one thing you touch upon something, and I want to reinforce that. You used the term when you were growing up that your home or your family was like a think tank and people used to come and the family or the, the people at the table, they always discuss about the issues and the solutions. Think tank, thinking, public policy issues, that is missing right now as we speak among both the parties, Democrat and Republican. We shout, we yell, we polarize, we don't talk about issues, public policy solutions. Why I'm mentioning this? Because I very well remember in 90s when Halle Barber used to be the chair of Republican National Committee we, at R RNC, we used to have six public policy councils. And we used to discuss about the issues affecting the, the, the Republic or the states, different states, from economics to international affairs, I don't see that even within the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, even at the local level, state level, or at the national level, that is the missing element. What are you going to say about that? I will say this, that it's time that we come together as people and stop running our mouth, stop talking and put the solutions to work. We all talk and we talk too much. You know, I'm a background of a salesperson. So I was, uh, when I was a young person, I sold uh, the kitchens for people in their homes. When I realized and I sold outside appliances, I sold home security systems, I sold automobiles. But there is a time that it's called the close of the sale. When you got the people's attention, that's when you close the sale. You can talk yourself out of the sale. And I've said that to many, many young people that I've seen sell things. I've said, I bought your product three times, but you have sold past it and you've talked me out of the product. So rather than talk the idea past it, let's put our actions uh, that we talk, put that to, to, to solutions and bring the solutions and bring the people to the table to, to captivate it and say, this is what we're going to do. You see, if you do nothing, you do nothing. If you do nothing, you get nothing done. You say nothing, nothing happens. So God gave us a mouth. 
and he gave us two ears. So we need to listen to what people say, talk what we have, and the actions come to through, and then put it together. And 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 I told uh, people in Annapolis on several occasions, I don't care who gets the credit. We're in this. We're working together. Uh, I have co-sponsored many, many Democrat people across the aisle. They have sponsored me because they know that we can get things together. You remind me of Ronald Reagan's quote, you know, that, well, it doesn't matter who gets the credit, get the things done. All right. So thank you. Now, let's trans let's make a transition or uh, the conversation that I was trying to have with you today. Right now, we hear or at least for the last four or five months at the national level, mistrust between black and white, BLM, Black Life Matters. No trust between the policing, reforms, justice. What is going on and what are the solutions? Where Where is the path that you see or you suggest? Because you are part of an important, as a, as a being in the delegate, House of Delegate in the state of Maryland, a bigger role to play. What are you going to say about all this? Here, here is what I, I share. I share the fact that there are two groups, the BLM, and they have got them confused. There's a Black Lives Matter movement and there's a Black Lives Movement group. And the Black Lives Movement group is sponsored and founded by three radical people that are out to destroy. In fact, the other day, one of the ladies told, told somebody to go and rob the place. It's our turn. That's that's the wrong. When you do things as as uh, our, our United States Congressman uh, John Lewis, you can protest nonviolence. You can protest and say what you want to say, but going into a target and destroying product and taking people's jobs and burning places down, that has taken the woman that's trying to keep bread and milk on the table for her, for her family, that she has a husband that might not be home. That's taking a job from a father. That's taking a job from a young person that is trying to help their mom and dad survive in the economic downturn of this country. So in the Black Lives Movement, that is a, a, a thing that we need to, to look at and again, bring them to the table and let's talk and get this stuff done resolvably where we talk about yelling and screaming and getting, that doesn't get the job done. When you bring people to the table and say, what is your issues? And let's resolve those issues with, with character, dignity, and love and respect. And what's taken place is that, the, the, you know, for an example, I'll bring this up, defunding the police. That is the most horrible thing you could do because you need to, as particularly at right now, what I'm saying is, does police reform need to happen? Yes, there's probably times, there's probably things in the police that we really need to take a look at. Um, is putting on somebody's neck, that was done back in the 1700s, 1800s. Is it time to do that now? It might be time to change. Is it time to legalize marijuana? It might be time to change. Is it time to, to look at the police? Is it time to, for an example, if a guy's driving down the street and he has a tag light out, would it be better because you got the computers in the car to take a, a ta picture of his tag and mail him a a a, a uh, citation or an inspection order and that way that he's been warned and he can get his fix? Would it be better because if a police officer pulls somebody up and they might have a, a, a warrant, that person might get scared and shoot the police officers? That's not good either. So there's many, many things that we need to really take a look at and the uh, uh, bring the bring the police reform into into practice. I think that needs to be done. I think that there are, and everybody knows this, there's people out there, some officers do not, they should not um, be, be, be a police officer. I, I am one of the sponsors of, of an amendment that we're um, hoping that Tim Scott follows through. I've shared with Tim Scott that we need to have across the board police training that is from Miami, Florida to Seattle, Washington. In other words, it all works together. What happens in Seattle, the same kind of training needs to take place in Miami. With that said, 
We also need to have a record of the police officers. Do the good, the bad, the ugly, their, their citations, their awards, their write-ups, what they did right. And also the, the registry of a police registry. That means that if a police officer got fired in, in Oklahoma City, that he can't come to New York City and get the same job. Excellent. Excellent idea. Solution. See, th this is what I wanted to hear from you, Delegate. Now, do you believe that other than those SOPs and police reforms, the big challenge and issue in our society right now where we see highly polarized environment in America, that we need also to be working towards making some reforms in hearts and minds? <laughs> And why I said so, because you being in the ministry, powerful speaker, you're more into it than people like others. What are you going to say about it? <laughs> Here's what I would say. The Bible is my guidebook. And, and I say this, that if I cannot show Shabab Carney my heart, if I can't show him my heart, how can he show me his? How can I show the world that I love everybody if I don't show my own heart? So we have got to change our hearts, our minds, and the way of thinking. And again, it goes back to when I started out in the very beginning. I don't know where you came from. You don't know where I come from. So we need to share our stories, share the story of where I come from. I had a lady in my office this morning that that she was talking about uh, a childhood abuse you'd have seen her on the street she looked down and so i was able to share with her and talk with her and she she left my office feeling rejoicing she felt rejoiced she felt so free so again it needs people to share our hearts and and this is something that's very very important to me and i say this all the time that we all have a gift. We all have a gift that lays stagnant. We, we sometimes call it our shadow side. But what we need to do is stir that gift and shake it up a little bit. And that's my job and people in leadership's job to see someone and stir that gift and pull it out of them and motivate them for change. And we can do that in this country. We have enough programs, uh, there are enough programs, Mr. Carney, that we don't need another program. We have programs on the book that need to be dusted off and replenished and refurbished and ups and, and motivate. You see, I'd rather be a Barnabas. I'd rather be an encourager to somebody than a discourager. And I say this with all due respect. It takes less. I smile all the time. It takes less muscles to smile than it does to frown. So it's a lot easier to be happy. And as the as the uh, old song used to say, don't worry, be happy. You see, life is short. Ladies and gentlemen, life is short. So we need to pull the best out of people. I'm, I'm sick and tired of seeing our young people. I'm sick and tired of seeing our young people shoot each other. And really, that's what's bothering this with this country. We're shooting each other. And we don't need to do that. We need to lift each other up and, and set them on a great moving path. I hear you now. The reason I'm asking you this follow-up question, well, ladies and gentlemen, there's a reason I am asking this to Delegate Rick Masger because people who don't know at the national level or in different states where this gentleman, Rick Masger, is coming from, let me explain to you. Maybe he is not aware of that. Rick Mesger is representing a district or an environment, which I will say 80% of America, mainstream America, mainland America is reflecting. Why? Because he is from a place where, like any other steel town, the economic, economic situation has gone down, un unemployment, drugs. So this is not going to be a good, healthy thing. Why? Because Across the aisle, black, white, brown, if you are economically weak, then you are more vulnerable for disaster, for destruction. So I want to hear from Delegate Mesger that 
from his district for his district or maybe that can be duplicated elsewhere nationwide what needs to be done to uplift people economically what ideas needs to be implemented mr master <laughs> what i'm what i'm looking forward to is again we went through an era several years ago where everybody needed to be a scientist everybody needed to be a doctor everybody needed to be a chemist well i'm here to tell you ladies and gentlemen everybody's not cut out to be the doctor everybody's not cut out to be a a ben carson everybody's not cut out to be a benjamin franklin everybody's not cut out ladies and gentlemen in this country we still need roofers we still need electricians we still need plumbers. We still need heating and vacuum uh, air conditioning. We still need uh, electricians. So, And we still need automobile mechanics. We still need the people to build the steel. We, we still need people to make the roofing. We still need people to make the sheetrock. What I'm saying there is we need to get back to trades and, and teaching the trades in our high schools. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, they had home economics um, and the girls and the women. And, and then it became they came together and, and listen, I learned to cook in school. I learned to, to bake a cake in school. I learned those things. But I also, ladies and gentlemen, learned how to put a nail in a piece of wood and make something of it. So I'm uh, uh, wanting to see the trades come back into our schools to, as, as the people say, make America great, keep America great, build America. You know, I was uh, in a meeting not, not very long ago that the, the roofers, there's some buildings in, in our own city in Baltimore City that need to be repaired, but they don't have roofers that could go do sky sky high buildings, the, the high rise buildings. They have to go to New York or Los Angeles to hire the roofers to do the buildings in our own city. Well, you know, that should not be. We want Marylanders to work. We want people to work. So we need to, to build and train and educate people in my district. Trade Point Atlantic and the community college, they're working together. They're, they're making uh, training truck drivers, for an example. The college is now starting to do other trades and teaching trades. The P-TECH program that Governor Hogan implemented to, to, again, bring the trades back into our schools. And I think you'll see that when people have something a, to do, they won't be on the street running around. They have a project to do. With that said, there is, I'm working with the mail system right now, and I suggested to the, the postal workers the other day, we have young people that's running the street. Why not bring the young people, give them a few dollars or give them some, some education scholarships or whatever we need to do to let them sort the mail where the, mo where the postal carriers can be out on the street delivering the mail instead of being backed up. These young people, they could do this. We could hire some, and as again, we could hire some retired people that could sit on a stool and sort the mail and give them some extra income as well. We can put people back to work. We can do these solutions. We can do these things, but we need to put it together. And I'm hoping I'm answering the question uh, as, as precisely I can. But I'm in an area, just to give you an example, I am in an area that when I have a fundraiser, uh, I have to be very cautious of what I charge for the fundraiser. Now, I can go four miles from my house and they can raise the price to double. And uh, so it's very hard for me to, to raise money in this particular area. I hear you, Delegate Metzger. Ladies and gentlemen, see, he did not bicker. He did not politicize the conversation. I asked him simple questions and trust me, we never, Delegate, I, we never exchanged the talking points. I just no. asked you. <laughs> candidly and i told you if you feel comfortable please answer me but ladies and gentlemen one thing that you need to uh, be at least appreciative of delegate Rizger, Metzger, that he never talk about any politics what we I, simple questions answers with solutions so whatever we heard from delegate Metzger were solutions and a roadmap way forward so i wish other politicians at every level in America can follow those leads as Delegate Metzger is offering. Delegate, in the conclusion, do you have to give out any message of whatever our topic was so that we can wind this up? Thank you, sir. 
I have to, to wind this up because I, I say this generally at every event that I do. And I simply say that this is the day the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice and be glad. And, and Chirab, it has been an honor to be with you today. It's been an honor to be in your presence just to share. And again, we never talked one time. In fact, I said to you, um, just ask me the questions and we'll go from there. So again, I want to bring solutions to whatever area I do, whatever we do, uh, tax credits, uh, helping our seniors, helping our young people get college, whatever we need to do, let's get the job done. Delegate Major, it was a great honor for me today, and definitely in coming weeks and months, we'll keep inviting you. We want to hear the solutions, and there are very few in public service elected officials that they have this kind of approach, and that was the only reason, honestly, to have you in my virtual studio. Thank you very much, sir. God bless you.